Liam Hogan, welcome to Australian Musician. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, Liam, you're a, a session drummer. You're very busy working with various bands. Um, That's right. How did drums become your instrument of choice in the first place? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I started uh, playing music when I was pretty young, I suppose. I, I started uh, in primary school I, for a very brief period. I, I played the, the trumpet and then I ended up uh, taking kind of keyboard piano lessons for, for a while. And um, that, that, never, that never really grabbed me for, you know, for whatever reason at the time. And um, the, the primary school that I was at uh, had kind of a, a marching band style uh, group at the time. And they, they had an, uh, a free spot for a, a snare drummer, like a marching snare drummer. And I thought, oh, I'll, wanna, you know, I'll give that a go. I'd always been kind of, you know, un until that point when I was really young, the, the, the kind of, you know, you hear these stories about drummers growing up and they're, you know, banging on pots and pans around the house and, and that kind of thing. And that was, that was very much me. Um, so I, I took a had a natural affinity for that at that point, I suppose. And then later on, when probably year year five or, or kind of early high school, I I, uh, I started playing, uh, taking lessons on on uh, on the drum kit and and kind of branching out to to that. And yeah, never looked back. <laughs> a lot of the American drummers I speak to come out of that marching band program, right? You know, yeah, it's, it's quite big over there. Yeah, I actually don't hear it as much in Australia. Like, I, you know, I think most most drummers kind of start on the kit right from the beginning, and uh, that's certainly true. Of like, I I have done a lot of music teaching as well, and I always would start start drummers on the on the kit. But um, yeah, over over in the US, it's um it's a there's a big marching band scene, a you know the college scene as well, like all the all the way up through all levels. So yeah. So what was your first kit? What did it consist of? My first kit was a was a funny mishmash of, of a bunch of different kind of secondhand gear. Really, um, it was kind of what I could get my my hands on at the time, and I I made it work as best as I could for probably a little longer than than I, I should have as well. But it it, worked, it served me well, me well for uh, all through kind of high school and and uh, I think even I got after that I got a my first kind of professional level kit. Uh, I got a, a custom made uh, Mapex satin and I had the opportunity to kind of design that everything like the shell construction and the finishes and everything and that was that was my real pride and joy for uh, for many years. I actually just gifted um, my I have a younger brother who um, just finished high school who I just gifted that uh, kit to uh, because he's a he's a, a buddy he's a fantastic drummer an all-round musician really as well but um yeah, he's uh, he's very appreciative of of having that that kit now. So yeah, that's great. And what about mm -hmm. drum heroes? Were there guys you looked up to? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's so many. Like, I have, I suppose, I have uh, heroes per se in in a bunch for like a bunch of different styles and a bunch of different reasons. Like, I remember when um, when I first got into kit, um, some of the early drummers that that. Uh, were introduced to me by um, my drum teacher at the time and, and who I was really inspired with were the kind of the technical drummers like uh, Dave Weckl was was a huge one for me. Um, uh, Tommy Igo, you know, there's kind of educational technical drummers. And and then from there, I kind of, um, uh, I got into the, I suppose, the metal thing for a little while. I, I was, I've never really been like a metal drummer, but there was, there was a drummer um, from a band called Porcupine Tree, uh, Gavin Harrison, his name is, who I was, and still am really, hugely inspired with just because of um, the, the musicality of his playing, I, I found really fascinating. Like just his approach to the drum kit and he would have, um, you know, Tom's tuned in a certain way and he'd have a collection of bells that's, that was part of his sound as well. And I, I loved his playing, um, still do to this day. And then um, uh, I guess later in high school, I got really into the uh, the jazz big band kind of side of things. And drummers like uh, Art, Art Blakey um, were, were really big for me at the time. And um, even uh, Miles, drummer from uh, back in back in the day, Philly Joe Jones, um, it was a it was a big one for me as well. But um, yeah, I mean, I have I have so many different drummers I, I look up to in 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 so many different 
worlds, I suppose you'd call them. Yeah, uh, you work with a variety of acts. Brecky Boy is uh, one of your main ones at the moment. You've played with right. yeah. Lindsay L, a Canadian singer-songwriter, yep. Nathan Cavallari, uh, Jack Bigden, uh, many artists. How, how important is that variety to you as a player? That it's, yeah, that variety, sorry, I'll start that again. That variety uh, for me is my, the, pretty much the thing that I hold most important and the thing that gives me the most satisfaction as a musician. Um, I love, and I've always loved uh, a huge variety of different um, music, you know, as a, as a listener um, and, you know, from a, a technical standpoint, studying different kinds of music. Um, so for me, that translates one-to-one -one with kind of the things that I've played. I've never been satisfied. I never, you know, one of the things that has been most important to me as a musician over time is just that, that I've, I've always wanted to be a musician first. I don't want to be even just a drummer or, you know, that, oh, he, Liam Hogan, he's a, he's a jazz drummer or he's a really great rock drummer or anything like that. I, I get the most satisfaction from playing uh, a variety of different styles and, and kind of, deep diving into each of them to to find out what you know what are the things that I really like about that and how can I improve my language in that um that area yeah. um and that yeah I guess from some of the artists that I've, I've been working with over the last couple of years that that goes to show I mean Lindsay um is a a country pop artist um which is in huge contrast to, to Brecky Boy we're an in instrumental jazz trio um, Nathan Cavalieri is a blues artist. Jess and Matt, uh, another another pop artist. Um, so yeah, kind of having that diversity, like I said, gives me a lot of a lot of satisfaction as as a musician. Yeah. Um, tell me about your main kit, the one you use with Brecky Boy. I, I imagine you use different configurations depending on who you're playing with. But um, yeah, uh, your main kit that you use most of the time. The, my main kit that I've used uh, with Brecky Boy um, is a is a Gretsch Catalina Club. Gretsch is a uh, has a long lineage of of making fantastic drums all round, but in particular, um, fantastic drums for the the kind of jazz sound. Um, and there's a lot of things I like about. I mean, the Catalina Club, which I've I've used for a lot of Brecky Boy uh, gigs and and even recording, is it's actually a, a, a quite a low cost kit compared to some of the other stuff that you can get but it just has it has a really specific unique sound um partially down to the shells um and just the sizes as well so uh having a, a smaller 18 inch bass drum 12 inch tom 14 inch um floor tom that kind of size configuration works really well for me um and it also makes it uh you know bricky boy we've done a lot of I'm not sure if you've seen. We've we've got some uh, some music videos where uh, kind of on the top of some cliffs and <laughs> locations like that, where it would be pretty difficult to to lug a you know a big heavy full size kit up. So having the combination of something that is small, compact, easy to carry, and sounds great for the music, um, Gretsch Catalina Club has it all. Ticks all the boxes. Yeah. Um, what about cymbals? What do you use, and and what do you re require from your cymbals? <laughs> Um, I guess I have uh, an interesting approach to symbols. All of my symbols are Zildjian. I've always used Zildjian symbols. Um, I, I love the sounds and the variety of, of tones that, um, that they produce across, across their line. But I will always choose, uh, kind of, I have a collection of, of symbols that I'll, I'll always choose specific um, pies from for, for a specific sound that I'm, I'm trying to achieve. So for the Brecky Boy, even amongst Brecky Boy, that there's some variation depending on kind of the style of gig we're doing. Like we've done some more um, electric, I guess, Robert Glasper direction um, uh, material that calls for a, a specific sound. Um, and then obviously uh, like the pop gigs that I play for, they, they require a I like to use a, a brighter kind of uh, heavier symbol for those kind of gigs. So, you know, I like to choose the symbols that are, are going to sound the best um, for me for, for that particular style of music. But tell me about Brecky Boy. How did that band come about? Uh, Brecky Boy uh, came from um, originally, so the, the pianist and, and lead composer for that group, Taylor Davis, um, we started music together at uh, the Australian Institute of Music in, in Sydney. 
And, um, you know, we, we played for a variety of uh, different things together, but it, it started as um, a kind of an experimental project of his that he was, he was writing this uh, instrumental piano driven music. Um, and he was on that kind of, that kind of train for a while. And he brought the songs to me and we, we started kind of workshopping them and, and honing into a sound. We, we recorded a, uh, an album at uh, that at Ames' own studio later um, that year, which I think was 2017. That was our that was our first album, and um, yeah, I, we brought on uh, Rob Hamilton. He's a, a double bass player. After that, and I think the thing that that made it really well has made it really enjoyable is that it, three of us. Um, we all have a, an affinity for that style of music uh, to begin with, um, influenced by, you know, I, I mentioned Robert Glasper before, but other artists like uh, Go Go Penguin, um, Shy Maestro, um, you know, there's the, the kind of instrumental piano trios of, of drums, piano and, and, and double bass that um, were pushing the, the boundaries of, of kind of, uh, of that sound and of, and of modern jazz that we, we all had an affinity for that. So, making that kind of music our own and, and trying to, to do that um, has, yeah, has been my, my, yeah, my all time favorite creative uh, project and creative outlet so far. Yeah. Uh, in 2019, you were selected to perform at the Montreux Jazz Festival, which is pretty awesome. And you're also That's right. the official house band uh, at a venue mm -hmm. where are, uh, artists like Shania Twain and Janelle Monet. Um, how was that experience? Uh, that that it was an amazing experience all round. It was it was uh, it was very in, in a word it was intense. Um, given that uh, obviously it was fantastic that we were you know chosen for this award and we got to travel to Switzerland and and uh, and do this festival. But so we were the we were the house band for the official festival jam session every night which ran from, I believe, 11 p.m. to five, about 5 a.m. every night. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I, as you can probably imagine, that kind of schedule is, uh, takes its toll, takes its toll on you, especially when, um, you know, we, we had a couple of other musicians who joined the house band um, as well from kind of local, local guys, and we tried to split it up as much as, much as possible. But when you're, you know, you're playing that much music, every night at those hours it's uh it gets it gets pretty pretty exhausting also given that uh you know it, european summer at that time it, it doesn't really start getting dark till about 10 anyway so you know we're we're out in the day and then we head inside for this jam session come out at 5 a.m and it's light again so we never really saw never really saw the night um but yeah other than that it was it was a really special experience um just being able to interact with and um, and play with such a variety of, of musicians on all levels. Obviously, you know, we had, you mentioned um, mentioned a, a few artists before, and then we have um, kind of guests from the general public that would get up and, and, and play as well. Um, yeah, it was, it was a lot and it was, it was great. <laughs> You've got a, a project happening with another musician, Eric Fortaleza. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me about Eric and, and the project. Yeah, so uh, Eric's a, a, a close friend of mine. We've, uh, we've been friends and, and uh, musical uh, partners for, for many years um, here in Sydney. Um, Eric, uh, Eric is currently living in, in Nashville, Tennessee, and um, he has started uh, this... Uh, a, I suppose you'd call it equally a movement as much as a, an organization uh, called the pitch meeting. And uh, what the pitch meeting is, is essentially uh, it's a nonprofit uh, organization, an artist development organization. And um, what they seek to do is provide a range of, of, of services um, to musicians uh, for the benefit of musicians. So that, Obviously, that's a broad statement and encompasses a lot of different things. But the ultimate goal is to become the, the first uh, musician-focused non-for-profit record label. Um, so it centers uh, around uh, a weekly songwriter pitch night in Nashville. 
uh, where uh, songwriters have the opportunity to come and, and, and showcase their music. But the difference is that this time, rather than just being like an open mic night where anyone can kind of get up, uh, there's a house band of, of world-class kind of touring musicians who are there all the time. And only original music, the songwriters can come up and they can showcase their tunes and the house band will, on the spot, play their music with them. Um, so that is, that's kind of the centerpiece and that becomes uh, a, uh, a, a big networking kind of event. And then on top of that, we have, um, uh, there's a studio in, in Nashville, in, in downtown Tennessee, that uh, a selection of those artists get to come back and, and record, um, record their music, workshop, songwriting, record video content, a bunch of different things. And then the ultimate goal is to be able to let them own their music and to be able to re release it, um, obviously, without the, uh, the contract situation of a, of a typical record label and without the necessary profit margins that those, those labels are in involved with. Yeah. So is there an opportunity for you to uh, create your own music within that framework too? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the most of the people that, in fact, all of the people that are involved with uh, pitch meaning uh, are musicians and um, and kind of songwriters of, of their own. So if everyone gets the opportunity to uh, to incorporate their, their own music within that as well. Yeah. So what's coming up uh, apart from that? Uh, what's coming up for Brecky Boy and anything else that you've got happening? Yeah, so uh, I guess the main thing that I'm, that I'm working on at the moment is uh, I've been working remotely uh, with uh, the Pitch Meaning group and just developing um, that project. Obviously, like I explained, there's, there's so many different elements uh, involved in, in that, that project that are they're going to take some time and, and effort and resources to, to, to kind of get going. And I'm, uh, I'm doing as much as I can from, from back here. Um, ideally, I, I'd eventually like to be able to uh, to get over there and, and work with them, kind of on the on the home front. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, uh, Bricky Boy uh, has a, a new album um, that we are currently working on uh, in the in the writing writing phase. And uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's taking up. All of my those two things are taking up all of my time at the moment. So yeah, very excited to for what the rest of the year holds. What's the grand plan for Liam Hogan? The grand plan, I, I would love to be able to uh, to move. I'm working at moving over to the US at the moment, um, and just kind of uh, of taking that, uh, riding that wave, and and getting things happening with with the pitch meeting group, and um, and everything that involves. Um, yeah, that's. That's, that's the trajectory for now. Yeah. Well, Liam Hogan, thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me, Greg. Appreciate it.